By definition, a battery is a group of cells. Cells that convert chemical energy into electrical energy. Cells that produce electricity can be grouped into two general categories, primary cells and secondary cells. Ordinary flashlight and radio cells are primary cells. They'll provide electrical power as long as they have chemical energy. But once that chemical energy is gone, the cell is worthless. Primary cells can't be recharged. Cells that can be recharged are called secondary cells. When the cell's chemical energy is used up, it can be restored by passing an electrical current through the cell. When several secondary cells are connected together, as they are in this lift truck battery, the combination is called a storage battery. While it's being charged, a storage battery converts electrical energy to chemical energy. When it's fully charged, the chemical energy is stored in the cells. Then when the battery is providing power or being discharged, its chemical energy is converted back to electrical energy. Throughout this unit, we'll be studying the lead acid storage battery. It's the most common type of all. Okay, try it now. Sounds good to me. For example, the battery that starts your car is a lead acid type. Lead acid batteries are also used for motive power. The battery in this electric lift truck provides all the power for its operation. This electrical substation contains a large lead acid storage battery. A battery this size can provide the relatively large amounts of power needed for switchgear control and for emergency light and power when there's a failure of the normal AC supply. Since this battery is the last reliable source of power for the substation, good battery maintenance is especially important. When AC power fails, the battery must be able to supply switchgear with the power it needs for emergency trips and ultimately for the switching required to restore AC power. Regardless of the application, lead acid cells all contain the same basic components, positive plates and negative plates, insulated from each other by separators. Both plate groups are submerged in a liquid called electrolyte, a mixture of sulfuric acid and water. An acid-resistant jar encloses the entire assembly. It's topped with a vent cap to allow for the escape of gases generated inside the cell. To see just how a lead acid cell converts electrical energy to chemical energy and vice versa, let's look at just two of the plates. A positive plate and a negative plate, submerged in electrolyte. When the plates are originally constructed, they're both composed of lead oxide, a dull grayish material. In this form, neither plate is electrically active. But when the cell is connected to the source of direct current, with the positive on one plate and the negative on the other, current begins to flow through the electrolyte. The action of the electrical current gradually turns the negative plate into pure spongy lead. The positive plate turns to lead peroxide. Another chemical reaction takes place in the electrolyte. Current passing through the electrolyte disassociates some of the water molecules into hydrogen gas, which bubbles up near the negative plate, and oxygen, which bubbles up near the positive plate. This gassing continues until the charging current is stopped. When the cell is fully charged, the negative plate is pure spongy lead and the positive plate is pure lead peroxide. The electrolyte has a fairly high concentration of sulfuric acid. If a load is connected to the plates of the charged cell, the cell begins to convert its chemical energy into electrical current. The cell is being discharged. 
When a lead acid cell is being discharged, several chemical reactions take place. Sulfates from the electrolyte combine with the plates, slowly changing them both into lead sulfate. Since the sulfuric acid electrolyte is the source of the sulfate, the electrolyte gradually becomes watered down. When the cell is completely discharged, both plates are pure lead sulfate, and the electrolyte is mostly water, with only a small amount of sulfuric acid in solution. In this condition, the cell is no longer capable of supplying electricity. Its stored chemical energy is used up. Before the cell can be used again, it has to be recharged. Charging current is passed through the cell in a direction opposite that of the discharge current. As current flows through the electrolyte, sulfates are driven off the plates and return to the electrolyte solution. The negative plate is slowly transformed back to spongy lead. The positive plate once more becomes lead peroxide and the sulfate removed from the plates combines with water to form more sulfuric acid. Once again, hydrogen and oxygen bubble up until the charging current is stopped. When the cell is fully charged, it's essentially been returned to its original charged condition, a negative plate of pure spongy lead a positive plate of lead peroxide, and an electrolyte with a high concentration of sulfuric acid. The charging current has restored the chemical energy that was lost during discharge. Any lead acid cell, regardless of its size, has a voltage of slightly over two volts when fully charged. For example, this cell has a voltage of 2.2 volts. But the size of a cell, or to be more precise, the surface area of its plates, does affect the cell's capacity measured in ampere hours. The larger the plate area, the greater the ampere hour capacity of the cell. The ampere hour capacity rating of a cell is simply a discharge rate in amperes multiplied by the number of hours that the cell can deliver that current. For example, the smaller cell can deliver 5 amps for 10 hours. That gives it a capacity rating of 5 times 10, or 50 ampere hours. The larger cell can supply 20 amps over the same 10 hour period. So its capacity is 20 times 10, or 200 ampere hours. Capacity ratings are important when you're selecting a battery for a given application. For example, the battery in this electric lift truck is designed to work an eight-hour shift and then recharge overnight. Before we see the recharge procedure, let's take a look at the safety equipment for battery service. A plastic apron helps keep acid splashes off your body. Sleeves protect your lower arms. And plastic or rubber gloves keep acid from getting on your hands. Good eye protection is especially important. And a face shield like this one also protects the entire face. The first step in the recharge procedure is to remove the vent caps and check the electrolyte level in each cell. There's a separate cap for each of the 12 cells in this 24 volt battery. If any of the cells are low, distilled water is added to bring the electrolyte up to the proper level. Distilled water is preferred because ordinary tap water often contains minerals that could contaminate the electrolyte and reduce the lifetime of the cells. Once each cell has been checked and filled if necessary, the battery charger can be connected. This plug connects the positive charger terminal to the positive battery terminal and the charger's negative to the battery's negative. The charger is a constant voltage type. It automatically maintains an output voltage of about 26 volts, 2.16 volts per cell. A constant voltage charger allows the battery to determine the actual charging rate in amps. As long as battery voltage is less than charger voltage, current will flow. 
At first, the battery's voltage is much lower than the charger's, so current flow is fairly high. With this vent cap removed, you can see the gas bubbles generated inside the cell. This normal amount of gassing won't hurt the battery, but hydrogen gas is flammable, so you don't want to be smoking or creating any sparks or open flames around a battery. If a cell was gassing violently, that would be a sign that the charging rate was too high. Violent gassing can knock the active material off the plates, so you'd have to reduce current flow to slow down the gassing. A high charging rate also affects cell temperature. Although the maximum allowable temperature varies according to different manufacturers and types of batteries, 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 Celsius is about as hot as you want to go. If temperatures get much higher, you have to reduce the charging rate to prevent warping and expansion of the plates from excessive heat. As the battery nears the end of its charge, battery voltage has increased to almost equal the charger voltage. As battery voltage has increased, the charging rate has tapered off. The charge began at 15 amps, and it's finishing up at about half an amp. This low value of current is called the battery's finishing rate. Experience has shown that an overnight charge gives this battery plenty of juice for a normal day's work. Periodically, though, the battery has to be tested, and sometimes it requires a more thorough cleanup and maintenance routine. In the next section, we'll see some of these periodic inspection, testing, and maintenance procedures. When we come back, though, we'll be looking at a lead-acid battery that's a little larger than what you've seen here. We'll be looking at the station battery. At electrical substations, power plants, and many industrial facilities, switchgear is controlled by DC circuits. Direct current is often used for switching and tripping breakers as a safety feature. If normal AC power fails, switchgear can still be powered by the station battery, the same battery that powers emergency lighting and other essential circuits. This battery is fairly typical. It has 58 lead-acid cells, kept on a floating charge of 2.25 volts per cell. With 58 cells connected in series, that gives the battery a total voltage of approximately 130 volts. A solid state charger is used to maintain that battery voltage. With a floating charge system, the charger kicks in whenever battery voltage drops below its set point. In this case, 130 volts. The system is designed so that the charger carries the normal station load. The battery is connected in parallel with the charger, so if AC power fails, or if the station load is unusually high, battery power automatically takes up the load. In this section, we're going to see some of the routine inspection and maintenance procedures that keep this battery in good shape. Many of these procedures apply to any battery on floating charge, even if it's not as large as this one. Safety procedures will also be similar. First of all, no smoking and no open flames. Batteries give off hydrogen gas, which can be flammable and even explosive when mixed with air. Second, locate the nearest eye wash station. If battery acid gets in your eyes, you don't have time to fumble around, and you may not be able to see the eye wash when you need it most. Third, don't carry any metal tools or equipment which are long enough to short across a pair of battery terminals. Remove any metal jewelry and any other exposed metal on your body. Even if voltages are low, batteries can put out enough current to weld rings to fingers or give you severe burns. Finally, wear the right protective equipment. 
For routine battery maintenance, you need a rubber apron, sleeves, gloves, and eye protection. It's just good sense to keep battery acid off your clothes, your skin, and especially your eyes. For this initial inspection, one worker keeps the records while the other one takes readings. The first thing they have to check is the float voltage. If it's set too low, the battery won't be getting a full charge. If it's set too high, the battery may be damaged by overcharging. The ammeter on the charger gives an indication of the battery's present condition. It should reflect the normal station load plus a small trickle current through the battery. Any current flow above the normal figure indicates that charging current is flowing to the battery, which should only happen after the battery has been at least partially discharged. Next, they check the temperature of the pilot cell. This cell, selected at random, is intended to reflect the condition of the battery as a whole. Cell temperature is one way to determine the state of charge of the battery. The temperature shouldn't be much above the temperature of the surrounding air unless the cell is drawing current from the charger. Once the temperature reading is recorded, they start checking the electrolyte level of each cell. If the electrolyte is between the high and low level markings on the jar, the level is okay. It's important to detect and correct low electrolyte levels before the tops of the plates are exposed to air. Otherwise, sulfates deposited on the plates during discharge can harden, making it difficult for the cell to get a full charge during the recharge cycle. Any cell with a low electrolyte level, like this one, should be topped off immediately. Only pure distilled water or water from an approved source should be used for watering cells. Impurities in the water can shorten cell life and even cause a cell to discharge itself inside the jar. It's also a good idea to keep track of which cells need water. Excessive water consumption may be a clue to other problems with individual cells. While the two maintenance workers continue to check electrolyte level in the remaining cells, they're also looking for any other potential problems. Problems like damaged jars, loose connections, and any corrosion or surface dirt on either the jars or the terminals. Corroded terminals like this one can create additional resistance between cells and keep the battery from getting a good charge. To clean a corroded terminal, first scrape off the flaky corrosion, being careful not to short across the cell terminals. Then brush away the powdery residue and dispose of it properly. The cell's vent cap should be covered with a rag to keep from contaminating the electrolyte inside. With the vent still covered, use battery cleaner or a baking soda solution or ammonia to neutralize any acid on the terminal. After the solution has stopped foaming, wipe it off with a rag. To prevent more corrosion in the future, coat with either a special spray coating or grease. Jars should be cleaned with soda or ammonia whenever there's a buildup of dust and dirt which can create conductive paths from a terminal to ground or from terminal to terminal. Be careful though. Check the manufacturer's instructions before using ammonia on any plastic battery jar. Some types of plastic will crack or melt when they're scrubbed with ammonia. What we've seen so far are just the beginnings of good battery maintenance, using the right safety precautions keeping records, maintaining electrolyte level, and keeping terminals and jars free of dirt and corrosion. In sections to come, we'll continue our look at the station battery and how it's maintained. When we come back, we'll start with how to determine the condition of the battery and its cells when we take a look at testing the station battery.
One of the primary purposes of routine battery testing is to determine the state of charge of each individual cell in the battery. We need to know if each cell is being fully charged by the float voltage. Earlier, we learned that as a lead acid cell is recharged, sulfates are driven off the plates and returned to the electrolyte solution. There, the sulfates form sulfuric acid. So the more sulfuric acid there is in the electrolyte, the higher the cell's state of charge. If we can measure the acid concentration, we can determine just how charged or discharged a cell is with a high degree of accuracy. This experiment will help illustrate just how we determine the acid concentration of battery electrolyte. Electrolyte is a mixture of water and sulfuric acid. It seems that a pint of sulfuric acid is significantly heavier than an equal volume of water. Let's see how much heavier it actually is. The scale's been zeroed so that the weight of the container won't affect the result. A pint of water weighs about one pound. A pint of sulfuric acid weighs a little more than 1.8 pounds. So we can say that sulfuric acid is approximately 1.8 times as dense as water. Density is measured in terms of specific gravity. The specific gravity of water is given as one. The specific gravity of concentrated sulfuric acid is 1.835. It's 1.835 times as dense as water. Any mixture of water and sulfuric acid will have a specific gravity somewhere between 1 and 1.835. Most lead acid batteries, when fully charged, have electrolyte at a specific gravity in the range of 1.2 to 1.3, approximately 40% sulfuric acid and 60% water by volume. On the job, we measure specific gravity with a hydrometer. It's basically a syringe, a glass barrel with a rubber bulb on one end. Inside the barrel, there's a weighted float that's marked off in units of specific gravity. If specific gravity is high, the float rises high in relation to the liquid. If specific gravity is low, the float sinks because the liquid supporting it is less dense. Here's what a normal specific gravity reading might look like. Read the scale right at the electrolyte level. This point represents 1.2. These scale divisions are each equal to 5 thousandths, so the reading is 1.210. You'll notice that the decimal point isn't used here. Checking specific gravity with a hydrometer is a normal part of periodic battery testing. Each cell is tested individually. And the hydrometer reading is recorded so it can be compared with previous results. To make a specific gravity check, stick the hydrometer's nozzle all the way into the cell. Squeeze the bulb and release it to draw electrolyte into the barrel. At some point, the level will be high enough to make the float rise. Once it's floating, squeeze the bulb just enough to hold the liquid level steady. Then read the scale right at the surface of the liquid. This cell reads about 1220, or 1.220. After taking the measurement and recording it, squeeze the bulb again and return the electrolyte to the cell. Then move on to the next cell and repeat the procedure. To get the most accurate specific gravity measurements, two considerations have to be taken into account. First, hydrometer tests shouldn't be done right after watering the battery. It's best to charge a battery for a specific period of time after adding water. This allows the water to thoroughly mix with the electrolyte. 
Otherwise, the water will just sit on top of the denser sulfuric acid solution, giving you a false reading. Second, hydrometer readings have to be corrected for temperature. Most hydrometers are calibrated to give correct results at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 25 Celsius. Lower or higher temperatures will make the electrolyte either more or less dense, even though the acid concentration is unchanged. In this case, after all the readings are recorded, the corrections will be made according to the temperature of the pilot cell. The thermometer shows a temperature of 73 degrees Fahrenheit, approximately 4 degrees colder than the base temperature of 77 degrees. The scale on the right-hand side of the thermometer indicates the specific gravity correction factor for temperatures above or below 77 degrees. This temperature is halfway between 0 and minus 2 on the scale. So the correction factor is minus 1. A reading of 1220 with a minus 1 correction factor gives a corrected reading of 1219. After all the readings have been corrected, most of the cells seem to be within normal limits. Except for cell number 34, a specific gravity of 1.180 is far below normal. Looking back over the last half dozen hydrometer checks shows that a trend has been developing. Specific gravity for cell number 34 has been steadily declining over the last few months. There are several possible reasons for the cell's low state of charge, but there's one simple corrective action that might take care of the problem. The first logical step is to put the battery on an equalizing charge. On this charger, moving the selector switch from float to equalize raises the bus voltage from 130 volts to 138. That means that individual cell voltage is increased from 2.25 volts up to 2.38 volts per cell. This increased cell voltage is intended to drive the last bit of sulfates off of the plates. It's an extended charge to return the battery to like new condition. Equalizing charges are routinely done on a periodic basis as part of normal preventive maintenance. In this case, though, the charge is being done as a corrective action. If cell number 34 is slightly sulfated, giving it an extended equalizing charge at the higher voltage may drive off enough of the sulfate to allow the cell to get a full charge. Throughout the charge, it's important to monitor cell temperature closely. To avoid cell damage, you may have to reduce the equalizing voltage if the temperature gets as high as 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Although a routine equalizing charge is sometimes set with a timer for a specific number of hours, the duration of this corrective charge will be determined by hydrometer checks of the lowest cell. Readings are taken every 15 minutes. And the equalizing charge is continued until the specific gravity of the lowest cell remains constant over five consecutive checks. Finally, the specific gravity of cell number 34 has stabilized, but it's still below the acceptable range. There's definitely a problem with the cell, but before taking any further corrective action, the two workers will continue with the routine test procedure by making a cell voltage check. Each cell is tested individually with a voltmeter while the charger is on and under normal station load conditions. Most of the cells show the expected reading. Up to this point, they're all close to 2.25 volts. But when number 34 is tested, the voltage is low, just as you might expect.
Number 34 shows only 2.04 volts, so the cell voltage test backs up the results of the specific gravity test. Cell number 34 isn't taking a full charge. After completing the rest of the cell voltage checks, some corrective action will have to be taken. There are several possible causes for the cell's low specific gravity and voltage readings. The cell could be sulfated. It could have been contaminated somehow during watering, or it may have separator damage, which can be caused by excessive heat. Whatever the reason, cell number 34 will no longer take a full charge, as we've proven in this section by testing its specific gravity, giving it an equalizing charge, and making cell voltage measurements. After voltage testing has been completed for all 58 cells, we'll come back to see the next step in maintaining a station battery when we take a look at cell replacement. Every so often, one cell of a station battery will fail to take a charge. In many cases, the only solution is to replace it with a new cell. The replacement cell may come from the manufacturer in any one of three conditions. Wet charged, dry charged, or dry uncharged. A wet charged cell has activated plates of lead and lead peroxide, and it's already been filled with the electrolyte by the manufacturer. Before it's installed, all it needs is a slow freshening charge at the finishing rate shown on the cell's nameplate. Dry charged cells also have activated positive and negative plates, but to improve their shelf life, they're not filled with the electrolyte. To put a dry charged battery into service, it first has to be filled and then given a freshening charge, just like a wet charged battery. New cells may also be received in the dry, uncharged condition. These cells have lead oxide plates that haven't been activated yet, and they aren't filled with electrolyte. Before a dry, uncharged cell is installed, it has to be filled, and then given an initial charge according to the manufacturer's recommendations. When new cells have to be filled with electrolyte before installation, Manufacturers often include a pre-mixed package of electrolyte, mixed to the correct proportions, so all you have to do is empty the container into the cell. Occasionally, though, maintenance personnel have to mix up fresh electrolyte from concentrated sulfuric acid and distilled water. Concentrated acid can eat holes through your clothes or skin a lot faster than diluted battery electrolyte can. This makes protective equipment especially vital. Gloves, sleeves, aprons, and eye protection are the bare minimum when you're handling concentrated acid. You should also make doubly sure that you know the location of the nearest eye wash and shower station. If any acid gets in your eyes, flush them with water or a neutralizing solution for at least 15 minutes, and then go see a doctor. If you spill acid on your clothes or skin, remove the clothes and flush your skin with water. Any serious acid burns on the skin should also be seen by a doctor. The right technique is the best way to avoid acid splashes when you're mixing electrolyte. Pour acid into water, not the other way around. Acid generates a lot of heat when it's diluted. If you accidentally pour water into concentrated sulfuric acid, the mixture may boil so violently that you'll get splashed with acid. Here's the right way to do it. Add the acid slowly to the distilled water so the mixture doesn't heat up as fast. Pouring down a glass rod helps keep the acid from splashing. Stir the mixture thoroughly with a glass rod. That'll keep the denser acid from settling on the bottom of the container. Even if you've calculated the approximate proportions, check the specific gravity of the solution before you've added all the acid. That way, you can avoid having to add water 
after you've made the solution too strong. Many of the potential safety hazards associated with mixing electrolyte are avoided when manufacturers ship the electrolyte in pre-mixed containers. This replacement cell for the station battery was shipped in the dry charged condition. Filling it up to the proper level with the packaged electrolyte is the first step in preparing the cell for installation. Once the electrolyte's up to the right level, the cell should stand for 20 minutes. This waiting period allows the electrolyte time to soak into the pores of the positive and negative plates. When the waiting period is up, the level is checked once again. The electrolyte level is slightly lower now, since some of it has had time to soak into the plates. To make up the difference, he adds electrolyte, not water. Adding water now would dilute the electrolyte beyond the recommended specific gravity. Once the level's been corrected, the cell is connected to a charger for its freshening charge. The manufacturer of this cell recommends that new cells be charged at the finishing rate, a low current value, for at least one hour before installation. While the replacement cell is charging, the maintenance men prepare to remove the faulty cell from the battery. Since the battery's online now, they've prepared a method for safely disconnecting the faulty cell with only a momentary interruption of battery power. This cutout switch is the key to that method. The cutout switch is a single pole double throw switch with a center off position. Using the switch prevents two potentially dangerous situations from developing. First, it allows all connections to be made with no possibility of arcing. Second, it allows you to jumper around the faulty cell without shorting it out. With the switch open, the lead from the center terminal of the switch is connected to the positive terminal of cell number 35. The lead from contact number one goes to the negative terminal of the faulty cell, number 34. The lead from switch contact number two connects to the negative terminal of cell number 33. To cut out cell number 34, first the switch is closed in position one. The switch and its leads are now in parallel with the cell connector, so the connector is removed. The switch maintains a current path. Next, the switch is quickly thrown to position two. Now the faulty cell has been cut out of the battery. The negative terminal of cell number 33 connects directly to the positive terminal of cell number 35. The battery can continue to function on 57 cells until a replacement is installed. The first step in the cell removal procedure is to sort out the leads and make sure the cutout switch is in the open position. Then the lead from the center switch contact goes on to the positive terminal of cell number 35. Since the switch is open, the next lead can be connected with no possibility of arcing. The lead from switch contact number one connects to the negative terminal of cell 34. The last connection is the lead from switch contact number two. It connects to the negative terminal of cell number 33. After all three leads are hooked up, the workers make a last check to see that each of the switch contacts is connected to the proper terminal. Once they've traced each lead from the switch to the battery, the switch box is closed up. Then the switch is closed in position one. This creates a current path parallel to the cell connector between number 35 and number 34. So the cell connector can be unbolted from the negative terminal of cell number 34. Now that one of the cell connectors has been disconnected from the faulty cell, the cell can be cut out of the battery. Battery power will be interrupted only for the amount of time it takes to go from position one 
to position two. Cell number 34 is no longer in the circuit, so now the remaining cell connector is unbolted from its positive terminal. Once the switch lead from the position one contact is removed from the cell's negative terminal, the cell's ready to be lifted off the rack. Here's one way to rig a cell for removal. A nylon sling is cinched around the cell and attached to a spreader so both men share the weight as they lift the cell. Before the new cell goes into place, they make sure it's in good shape by taking a specific gravity reading and recording the figure along with the date the cell was activated. A cell voltage reading also goes on the record, so if the cell ever develops problems, its voltage can be compared to this original reading. Both readings are within normal limits, so the new cell is rigged for lifting and carefully hoisted into position on the rack. Putting the cell on line with the rest of the battery is simply the reverse of the cutout procedure. After the cell's in place, the cell connector from cell number 33 is reconnected and the lead from switch contact number one is clipped to the negative terminal of the new cell. Then the cutout switch is thrown to position one. This connects the new cell in series with the rest of the battery. Once the last cell connector is replaced, the cutout switch is returned to the open position. At this point, it's safe to disconnect the three switch leads from the battery. Once again, the station battery is functioning on all 58 cells. As we've seen in this section, replacing a cell doesn't have to be difficult or dangerous as long as you know and follow the right procedures. In the sections to come, we're going to move on to another essential element of the station battery system when we take a look at the fundamentals of battery chargers. After a storage battery has been discharged, its cells no longer contain enough chemical energy to supply electrical current. Recharging a cell is a process in which electricity is used to restore that chemical energy. Only direct current can be used for charging batteries. Essentially, the process involves reversing the direction of a cell's discharge current flow. While a cell is being charged, electrons are flowing into the cell's negative terminal instead of flowing out of the negative terminal to a load. Battery chargers, then, must be devices that can supply direct current to a battery. Direct current in the right direction, at the right voltage, and with the right amperage. Typical battery chargers can be grouped into three general categories. Motor generator sets, rectifier type chargers, solid state chargers. Each type converts alternating current to direct current and has some means of regulating voltage and current to a battery. Motor generator sets are the most basic type of battery charging equipment. In essence, they consist of an AC motor that drives a DC generator. The generator output supplies a DC voltage to the batteries. Today, motor generator sets for battery charging are mostly found in older installations. And even here, they're often being replaced by the more modern solid-state chargers. Here we can see both the old and the new functioning side by side. In this application, the motor generator set is used to keep the plant battery on a floating charge of approximately 130 volts. The output of the generator has to be regulated to maintain that voltage regardless of the amount of load placed on the battery. In practice, the AC motor drives the generator at a constant speed. 
The output voltage of the generator is regulated by controlling the current flow through its field windings. In this shunt generator, a portion of the generator output is used to energize the field windings. Turning a rheostat increases or decreases current to the field. More current means a stronger magnetic field, so generator output goes up. Less current means a weaker field, so the output voltage goes down. At this typical older installation, the field rheostat is controlled manually from the control room. As the DC load increases, an operator adjusts the rheostat to increase the generator output. When load decreases, the generator output has to be reduced to prevent excessively high voltages from being applied to the battery. Although motor generator sets have proven to be reliable battery chargers, the field rheostat arrangement does require a human operator to monitor the charging voltage. In newer plants, battery charging voltage is typically regulated automatically. Automatic voltage regulators can be used with motor generator sets. But at this plant, the situation is further simplified by eliminating all rotating machinery for battery charging. Instead of being charged by a motor generator set, this battery is charged by a rectifier type charger. Visible here on the outside of the charger are the AC and DC breakers a DC ammeter, a DC voltmeter, a mechanical voltage regulator, and a high voltage protective relay. With one of the covers removed, we can see the heart of the charger, its selenium rectifiers. These are the components that convert alternating current to direct current. This symbol is the schematic representation of a rectifier. It's a component that conducts in only one direction. The electrons flowing this way can pass through. But electrons flowing in the other direction are blocked. Here's what happens when an AC voltage is applied across a rectifier. During the positive half cycle, the rectifier conducts. During the negative half cycle, the rectifier stops conducting. The rectifier passes current in pulses, but the current that gets through is always in the same direction. The resulting output current from a rectifier looks like this. Pulses of direct current, each separated by one half cycle. This is called half wave rectification because only half of the sinusoidal current can flow through the rectifier. We're getting a DC current, but not a very steady one. DC output characteristics can be improved by connecting four rectifiers in an arrangement called a full wave bridge. These two terminals are for the AC input, and these two are for the DC output. Here's how the bridge works. On a positive half cycle, input current flows in this direction. Two of the rectifiers allow current to pass, so this output terminal is negative, and this one is positive. On a negative half cycle, the input current flow reverses, and the other pair of rectifiers conducts. The negative output terminal is still negative, and the positive output terminal is still positive. The bridge always conducts in the same direction regardless of the direction of input current flow. The output current of a full wave bridge looks like this, a series of pulses packed close together. The output current still ripples, but it's much more continuous than that of a half wave rectifier. This battery charger has two full wave rectifier bridges connected in parallel to increase the current capacity of the unit. Each bridge is surrounded by cooling fins to dissipate the heat produced by the rectifiers. Since heat is directly related to current flow, 
A thermostat here is used to control the charger's protective overcurrent relay. Like other battery charging systems, rectifier types require some means of regulating the charging voltage and the resulting current flow to the battery in response to changes in battery load. This particular unit uses a mechanical type voltage regulator. The charger's float voltage set point is adjusted here. And its equalizing voltage is adjusted here. A toggle switch is used to select either the float or the equalize position. When the charger's voltage is exactly at its set point, this meter needle floats directly in between two pegs. If battery load changes, the needle will peg in either the high or low position. When the needle pegs, a mechanical linkage is engaged. The linkage closes one set of contacts if the voltage is low, and another set of contacts if the voltage is high. Through the contacts, a small motor inside the unit is energized. The motor rotates the control shaft of a variable auto transformer. If the low voltage regulator contacts are closed, the motor turns the auto transformer to raise the voltage. If the high voltage regulator contacts are closed, the motor turns in the opposite direction. So the auto transformer rotates to reduce the AC voltage supply to the rectifier bridges which reduces the charger's DC output voltage. This is one system for ensuring that the plant battery is always maintained at the correct voltage, without the need for constant monitoring. This system, however, does have two major disadvantages when compared to the more modern solid-state chargers. First, selenium rectifiers generate a lot of heat. Proper cooling is essential, and even if it's provided for, the heat tends to age the rectifiers. As they age, periodic adjustments are necessary to compensate for reduced current flow through the bridges. The second disadvantage involves the mechanical system of voltage control. Rectifier type chargers can use any of a variety of voltage regulators, but in this unit, adjustments to the mechanical linkage can be complicated and critical to the performance of the unit. Both of these disadvantages have been overcome in modern solid state battery chargers. On the outside, a solid state charger is very similar to a rectifier type. This unit has AC and DC breakers, a DC voltmeter, a DC ammeter, a float or equalized selector switch, and two potentiometers for adjusting float and equalized voltage set points. This drawing, though, shows some internal differences that are immediately apparent. There are no rectifier cooling fins and no moving parts. This module contains a solid state version of a full wave rectifier bridge. The bridge consists of two silicon diodes, semiconductor devices that function like selenium rectifiers without their heating problems, and two silicon controlled rectifiers or SCRs. SCRs are one-way conductors, just like silicon diodes and selenium rectifiers are. But SCRs have a third lead, called a gate. When a control voltage is applied to the gate, an SCR passes current like any other rectifier, in one direction only. But when the gate voltage is removed, an SCR allows no current flow at all. In practice, voltage control is achieved by precise timing of gate pulses. If a control pulse is delayed slightly, output voltage and current are reduced. If the pulse timing is advanced, output voltage and current are increased. Control pulses to the SCR gates are generated here, 
in the control module. In this case, the control module consists of two printed circuit boards. The first board compares the rectifier output voltage to a preset reference voltage. If rectifier output is too high or too low, the circuit generates a proportional error signal. The error signal travels to the second board, the pulse network. This circuit translates the error signal into timed pulses that trigger the SCR gates. Most of the other components inside a solid state charger are either protective devices, alarms, or terminal blocks. Many units also contain filter circuits. This unit has an array of capacitors and a choke coil. Together, these components reduce the amount of ripple in the full wave DC output, changing the pulsating rectifier output into a steadier, more continuous DC waveform. Because of their reliability and precise voltage control, solid state chargers are becoming standard equipment for all kinds of battery charging applications. This is only one example of the many types of solid state chargers available today. In the next section, we're going to see a slightly different solid state charger when we take a look at charger inspection and adjustments.